The goal of this unit is to learn how to go about synthesizing alkynes with the carbon-carbon triple bonds from alkenes, which have a carbon-carbon double bond. We're going to accomplish this using a series of reactions of which some of those reactions should be familiar from ones that we've seen before. So let's go ahead and take a look at how to convert alkenes into alkyne functional groups. So what we'll do is we will start with any alkene molecule and we're going to do two reactions in a row. The first reaction is going to be an addition reaction where we're going to add across the carbon-carbon double bond either chlorine or bromine, so Cl2 or Br2, much like when we were looking at the reactions of alkenes that we've seen in the past. The typical reaction type of alkenes is addition, and so when we mix Cl2 or Br2 with an alkene, the chlorine atoms or bromine atoms are going to add across the carbon-carbon double bond, and you've seen that reaction before to yield a vicinal dihalide. So a molecule that has adjacent carbon atoms, meaning the uh, adjacent carbon atoms with halogen atoms on each of those carbons. So we call it a vicinal dihalide. Vicinal meaning the two halogens are on adjacent carbons. Then what we'll do is take that vicinal dihalide and do an elimination reaction. In other words, we're going to use a base to enable the removal of a proton and to cause one of the halogen leaving groups to leave. We'll then do that reaction a second time to force another halogen leaving group to leave and leave us with an alkyne as our final reactant. So what I'll do here is indicate that we need a really strong base to carry out this second step of the reaction. So let's go ahead and look at this reaction in a little bit more detail, starting with an example. Starting with an example problem, so we'll go ahead and write out our example. So I've written out an example here where we're going to start with an alkene molecule, as you can see there. React it with chlorine, Cl2, and you'll notice that also written in that reaction mixture is DCM, dichloromethane. And when you see the abbreviation DCM with a reaction, expect that that dichloromethane is serving the role of a solvent. So it is just the soup that the reaction takes place in. It is not directly participating in the reaction at all, so we can pretty much ignore that when we're thinking about what product is going to form as a result of this reaction. As a result of this reaction, we expect there to be addition of the two chlorine atoms across the carbon-carbon double bonds. We'll go ahead and draw that reaction product. Remember that when we're adding two Cl2 atoms across the carbon-carbon double bond, there's not going to be any carbocation rearrangements or anything like that because the intermediate instead is stabilized through resonance by forming that three-membered halonium ion, the three-membered ring bridge connecting the chlorine to the two atoms that were once the alkene group atoms. So we'll go ahead and add here, the gist of it is, the two chlorine atoms across what was originally our carbon-carbon double bond. So here's our carbon-carbon double bond, and now we've added the two chlorines to each of those two carbon atoms. So from here then, what we need to do, now that we have our vicinal dihalide intermediate, is bring in, as indicated up here, a strong base. And I need to make a little bit of mention here about what we're referring to when we talk about a strong base. Usually the strong base that we'll use here is going to have to be something stronger than just sodium hydroxide. Instead, it's going to have to be something that has, say, a nitrogen anion present in it. Because remember that having a nitrogen anion is going to make for a more strong base than having an oxygen anion because nitrogen is less electronegative and therefore it's less happy to handle having a negative formal charge. In other words, nitrogen is less stable as an anion and hence it makes for a more strong base. So nitrogen anions present in molecules tend to make strong bases. Also hydrogen anions or hydrides make for strong bases as well. So some examples that you'll very commonly come across here of strong bases that are suitable for this reaction are going to be things like sodium amide, NaNH2, and what that is going to contribute as the actual participant in the reaction is going to be that amide anion, which is a nitrogen with a negative formal charge, and having that negative formal charge in the nitrogen is going to make that nitrogen rather unstable, hence very reactive as a base. It's going to be very eager to grab a proton. Um, another example is a compound called lithium diisopropyl amide, or LDA for short, lithium diisopropyl amide. And the structure of that is going to have a nitrogen bonded to two isopropyl groups, hence the diisopropyl part of the name. 
and that nitrogen will have two sets of lone pair electrons, just like the nitrogen did up here. And that means that this nitrogen as well, like the one up top, is going to have a negative one formal charge. So we're going to put the negative on there. And then the L from LDA stands for lithium. Lithium is just your counter ion, playing a role much like sodium did up top, of just being a spectator ion along for the ride because you have to have a positive charge to counter that negative charge that is present in the molecule. Another example of a strong base, this time going with an example that will have a hydrogen anion present, is going to be, we'll use sodium hydride, NaH, as an example of a strong base that has a hydrogen anion in it. If we take a look at that, the electrons are largely going to reside on the hydrogen because the hydrogen is much more electronegative than the sodium. And so we can put a lone pair there essentially on the hydrogen, giving that hydrogen a negative formal charge and making that hydrogen atom very strongly reactive as a base. It's going to be very eager to grab a proton because it has that lone pair of electrons there. So what we're looking at here on this right hand side of the page that I'll put this green box around are examples of really, really strong bases. These are the bases that are going to be suitable for carrying out this next step of the reaction. Sodium hydroxide, on the other hand, is much weaker than any of these bases that we listed here, so they're not going to work as effectively in carrying out this next stage of the reaction that requires, as we said, a really strong base. So we'll go ahead and bring in our strong base here, and I'll just use sodium amide as my example here, so NaNH2. And we will go ahead here and plug in NH2 with its two sets of lone pair electrons as the reactive component of this. Remember that really strong bases are super eager to grab protons. So as we look at this molecule, I'm going to plug in a couple of our protons here explicitly, there and there. So what you'll notice is that each of these protons are beta to one chlorine atom. So for example, this chlorine atom and carbon has this proton set up beta to it. Remember that in the chapter on elimination we talked about beta elimination where we described this carbon atom as the alpha position because it has that chlorine leaving group bonded to it. And the next position would be the beta position. So when we talked about beta elimination we say we're removing a proton from the beta position by bringing in a base right here like this. That forces the carbon-hydrogen bond to break and the electrons from that to come over to make a carbon-carbon double bond. And this is enabled by the fact that chlorine is a really good leaving group. That bond between carbon and chlorine is relatively weak. And when we break it and take the electrons with the chlorine, that's going to give us a relatively stable chloride anion product. So let's go ahead and draw out the product that would result from this elimination type reaction. So this is going to be a throwback to that E2 elimination reaction that we talked about a couple of chapters ago. Let's go ahead and draw out the product from this E2 elimination. And I'm not worrying too much about stereochemistry here along the way. In other words, I'm not worrying about drawing in my wedges and dashes or anything like that because ultimately we're headed for an alkyne which is going to just be linear at the alkyne group and so we won't really need to focus on stereochemistry at the end so we're not really focusing it on it in the middle here either. And I will go ahead and draw out though all the hydrogens that actually remain in this molecule and remember to put in the carbon carbon double bond because we took that carbon hydrogen bond and I'm drawing in red and brought that over using the electron pushing arrow to make the carbon carbon double bond that we see right here. Okay so now at this point if we take a look at what we've created here our alkene group that we have an alkene group present in the molecule and we have a leaving group there, our chlorine. So what we can do then is look at this again and we can now say that this is our alpha position. That's what's bonded to the leaving group, our chlorine. One spot over we refer to as the beta position and we do have a proton there that we could remove in a second elimination. So, so we could remove that proton in green doing a second elimination where the chlorine leaving group leaves and gives us our alkyne product. So let's go ahead and do that here. So we're bringing a second equivalent of base. So we have NaNH2 written here. And we're going to do a second E2 elimination reaction. Remember it's called E2 because the rate limiting step of this reaction mechanism has two molecules coming together. And those two are the base and in this case the 
haloalkene. So the active component of our NaNH2 is going to be the NH2 anion. So we bring that in using our electron pushing arrows to grab a proton. Once that base grabs the proton, the bond between carbon and hydrogen, in other words, the bond between carbon and that proton is going to come over to add another carbon-carbon bond. And then at the same time that that happens, to avoid going over that tet for the carbon, the chlorine leaving group has to break away. So that's going to leave us then with a carbon-carbon triple bond in our final product. So we'll go ahead and draw out our carbon-carbon triple bond in our final product. And to keep track of where everything is, it is often useful to go ahead and number some of the atoms here. So we could go ahead and number one, two, three, four, five, just numbering the carbon chain there so I can keep track of where everyone's going. So between carbons two and three is where our alkyne group should end up. And then continuing on our chain to carbon four and carbon five, it's that carbon four where we had the methyl branch come off. And that is all that's gonna be left in this molecule at the end. So our final product here is going to have an alkyne. And that's the result of a series of two reactions that you should already be relatively familiar with from our earlier work. So we took an alkene, converted it into a vicinal dihalide, treated that vicinal dihalide with a strong base to do a double elimination using E2 reaction mechanisms to give an alkyne. Let's do one more example of this reaction type to make sure that we've solidified the knowledge that we've learned here. So here's our example problem. We're asked to predict the final product of the reaction and provide a mechanism showing so we'll take a look at predicting the final product. I encourage you to hit pause here to make sure that you can do this on your own. And then I'll work through the answer. So here's the solution. So as a result of the first step of this reaction, I'm just gonna product of one here, meaning that this is the product of the first reaction that we're doing. So the product of adding bromine across the carbon-carbon double bond will correspond to having a bromine at carbon two and a bromine at carbon three. We looked at the mechanism for this reaction back in our chapter where we're doing addition reactions of alkenes. Then what we'll do with this product of step one is we'll bring in our sodium hydride and I am gonna show the mechanism for this since this is our new focus of this particular unit. So our sodium hydride, the reactive component of that is not the sodium. The sodium is gonna be present as a spectator but instead it's gonna be the hydride portion, so H minus. And I will show our protons of interest in our reactant explicitly here. So we have that proton and this proton. And what's going to happen is the hydride acts as a base, so it's gonna be very eager to grab one of the two beta protons. It doesn't matter which one you grab first. So we're gonna go ahead and define to start with here, this is the alpha position with the leaving group bonded to it. That leaving group is the bromine that I'm showing attached to the green bond here. And then the adjacent carbon is the beta carbon, and we call this beta elimination because it's going to be that proton at that beta position that is removed during this elimination. So the base, that is our hydride, H with a lone pair of electrons, comes over, acts as a base to grab that proton that forces the carbon-hydrogen bond in blue there to break and the electrons from it to come over to make a carbon-carbon double bond. And in order to do that, we absolutely have to have the leaving group break away and leave so that we don't go over the octet rule. So this is going to give us our intermediate here as a result of this first elimination reaction. So we'll still have our four carbon chain. We'll still have the bromine right here. We haven't done anything with that bromine just yet. The hydrogen that we showed on the right in blue is no longer there. It was removed to give us H2 as the product by forming a covalent bond between those two hydrogens. And the carbon-hydrogen bond, that is the bond right here in red, has now come over to make a carbon-carbon double bond, which I'll show in red in this product. The bromine leaving group on the left there, that alpha carbon has left. The hydrogen, on the other hand, in blue, on that left-hand carbon is still there, so we'll go ahead and draw that in. Now what we need to do, since we have ample sodium hydride to do this, is we're gonna do another elimination reaction. So what we'll do here is take our intermediate that we created just now, bring in another sodium hydride, 
and I'm just going to put the hydride part in here, the H minus, because that's the part that's actually doing the work. Then what we do is use that hydride lone pair electrons to act as a base, grab the proton here, and we would refer to this carbon that this is bonded to as our beta carbon, and the alpha carbon is the one bonded to the leaving group, so we're doing a beta elimination here of that hydrogen. And the carbon hydrogen bond right here breaks, the electrons come over to make a carbon carbon double bond. At the same time, that carbon bromine bond breaks, meaning the leaving group is leaving. So that's going to give us, as a result of this step, formation of our alkyne bonds. We had a four carbon chain, and the alkyne is coming in between carbons two and three of the chain, so that would give us this molecule, 2-butyne, as our product. We would also, as a result of this step, generate H2, and what I've been sort of omitting as we go through kind of the abbreviated mechanism here is the bromide anions that would result from the breakaway of the bromines at each of these steps of elimination. So that's going to be how we go about creating alkynes from alkene starting materials, or alternatively, if we started with a vicinal dihalide and treated it with a strong base, that would be a way to get to the alkyne product. Most commonly, though, the cheap, readily available starting materials are going to be alkenes, which will convert to vicinal dihalides, and then onward to alkynes.